Police were all over the Manhattan Federal Courthouse as the largest terrorism trial in U.S. history ended after one week of deliberations. The jurors, known only by number, found blind Muslim Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and nine of his followers guilty of seditious conspiracy to wage a war of urban terrorism to pressure the U.S. to change its Middle East policy. With the Sheikh as the spiritual leader, the terrorist plot included bombing five New York landmarks within a 12-square-mile area in the space of 10 minutes. And there was a plot to murder Egypt's president, Hosni Mubarak. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest episode of the Roads to 9-11 interview series with Adam Fitzgerald. Today, we're going to be looking at events immediately after the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993, the landmarks terror plot, and the ultimate arrest of Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman and his terrorist cell. In the last episode, we spoke about Imad Salem, the ex-Egyptian army officer who infiltrated the cell prior to the bombing, before the FBI pulled him out. And Adam starts off by picking up on his story once more. Soon after the bombing of the World Trade Center, uh, the FBI contacted him at Salem in hopes of having him infiltrate the Brooklyn cell led by Blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman at the Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn. And the FBI would have no other choice besides using Salem, and time was running out, and the FBI were rather worried about another large scale terrorist attack that would take place somewhere within New York City. Um, Nancy Floyd actually calls Salem and visits him and urges him to return. And Salem, Imam Salem, uh, protested to Floyd and exclaims that only if the FBI would have uh, listened to him at first and followed uh, Mahmoud Abulima and Mohammed Salome, the World Trade Center bombing uh, would have been prevented. Um, but Salem uh, reluctantly agrees to come back. And Salem and his handler, Louis Napoli, agreed on a structured payment of a million dollars. Um, Salem, of course, he still has been at first devises a plan himself um, by recording his sessions with the FBI handlers and the joint terrorist task force of Louis Napoli and John Anderson. Um, this was done because he feared that they would implicate him in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Um, Salem returned to the Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn and he was immediately met with another prominent member and a close associate to um, Omar Abdel Rahman named Sadiq, Sadiq Ali. Um, Ali confronts Salem with a proposal and that Sadiq is planning, which was to help him, Salem along the bombing of numerous New York City landmarks and neighborhoods. And this is commonly known as the landmark plot. Okay, just, I'll just pick up on a couple of things there. Sure. Um, it's probably worth pointing out that in contrast to this million dollar figure, Salem had been previously paid $500 a week, right? And I think an additional 500 a month for expenses. So rather more expensive to get him um, back in. And he was genuinely concerned for his safety because he had the inside details on how the FBI had effectively let this plot go ahead. Um, I think when he walked into the office, he saw his picture up there with the, the rest of the suspected conspirators and thought they're doing a number on me here. They're either going to implicate me or I'm, they're going to leak that I'm an inside man because it was leaked to the media that mm. the FBI had had a mole inside. They're going to leak and have him killed that way. So he really genuine fears for his safety from, from the FBI, right? That's correct. Um, well, only because that he himself didn't trust he broke the cell as well. Um, so he really had no one to trust besides Nancy Floyd. He actually trusted only yeah, his original her. handler. Right, well, was he else. able to get back in to the Brooklyn cell or did they find it suspicious that he disappeared and reappeared? How did he smooth that over? Actually, uh, I'll link it through. When, when the World Trade Center bombing was uh, happening, he could strike. He actually tells Omar Abdelrahman that he believes that he's being followed by the FBI. This was his way of getting out of building a bomb because that it described him first to build the bomb to be used at the World Trade Center. And he didn't know how to build a bomb because he tells him he knows how. And that was his way of leaving the operation without um, being told that or, or insinuating that he's a mole. So they believed him. And that's when they get Ramsey Youssef as a backup into building a bomb. And the FBI actually um, doesn't trust him at to the point 
was that he's bringing pertinent information because they thought he was too demanding. He tried calling them at night. They couldn't pick up at night. He complains to Nancy Floyd about the, you know, the non-communicado of uh, uh, Antisa of Napoli and the FBI headquarters with Carson Dunbar. Does not trust them as well? He thinks that he's being set up or that he's not being taken seriously. And this would, you know, of course, be true with the payment that he's receiving, which is less than menial because he had big expenses as well. Um, but after the 93 bombing, he realized that Ebert Slim, was, his information was uh, pertinent. It was, it was important. And that they, they knew that by, um, by support, you know, trying to arrest these people at the food cost, they had to use him because he's the only one that would be, you know, be used as the deep mold that they needed the inside information regarding the blind sheik. And so that they, they welcome him back. He comes back and tells him that he doesn't believe the FBI is following him anymore. And one of the first people he meets is Sadiq Sadiq Ali. Um, and he relates to him that they're creating another plot. And this plot was the landmark plot. And it would involve the bombing of the UN headquarters, Lincoln Tunnel, the Holland Tunnel, uh, George Washington Bridge, the UN, Plaza Hotels, the FBI headquarters at Jacob Tabbitts, and of course the assassination of um, U.S. Senator uh, Al D'Amato, um, Egyptian President Jose Mubarak, and um, of Hakkind, who was a U.S. Assemblyman, and as well as planting 12 bombs around um, Jewish neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Manhattan while having them detonate simultaneously. This was a very large operation, which would involve a lot more people than, say, the 93 bombing. So the, um, immediately the FBI began to open up a file against Rahman and the members involved in the landmark plot. So Salem um, began recording. And between May 7th to June 23rd, 1993, Salem would have 63 recordings for the, uh, the, the Attorney General of New York and the FBI to go over. Um, meanwhile, Sadiq Sadiq Ali would have members of the mosque and the landmark plot run assassination drills at a training camp in um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And Salem's most valuable recording would be a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the blind sheikh at Rahman's own kitchen. Rahman, who's blind, and could not see that Ahmad Salem was carrying a briefcase that he always had, had on his person, which was wired for sound. And one night he held up the briefcase and recorded the conversation where Salem relates that Sadiq Sadiq Salim plan to blow up the UN and Rahman, Salem's recording went as uh, follows. Um, quote, Salem, we are preparing for something big, something big that will bring it upside down. So is this considered illicit or illicit? And Rahman, quote, it is not illicit. However, this will be bad for Muslims. Find a plan to incite damage to the American army itself. And, well, there it was. I mean, Salem getting Rachman to approve of a terrorist attack on the U.S. military. And at around this time, Rachman confronts Sadiq Sadiq Ali about, about having um, a plot to use a plane, a military plane, to clash into the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. Egypt, in, in Cairo, Egypt, in hopes of having... Yeah, um, it, was, it was a Sudanese That's right. military plane, right? Because Sadiq right. Sadiq Ali is Sudanese. That's correct. It was a Sudanese military plane where, where, as the plane was going to hit the U.S. Embassy, the cloud would eject out of the plane and the plane would crash, killing Mubarak, who's in the U.S. Embassy. Um, now, however, the plan um, never goes beyond discussion stage, and I just wanted to bring that up. The spot, but the responsibility of funding for the, of finding bomb fuses, which would um, be used in the Lambert plot, land on uh, um, a prominent member of the Alfred Mosque called Wadi Hampton Hill. Um, it was here that the FBI confronted Salem and gave him an idea. Um, replace the bombing fuse and caps and powder with fake, uh, with fake caps and powder. But Salem refuses and worries that if the plan would come to fruition, he would be found out as the mole and ultimately killed and his family killed in Egypt. But the FBI had, um, had other ideas. So the safe house, which Salem rented for the bombs to be made, and which was a warehouse located in Jamaica, Queens. So, by the way, the warehouse was completely wired for sound and had um, hidden CT cameras, which the FBI um, had 
uh, in place. They caught everything the plotters could script. The FBI, uh, meanwhile, without Salem's uh, knowledge, replaced bomb accounts, but didn't replace the cap with a fake one, and instead used a real device, which was a mistake because uh, Carson Dunbar actually wanted it to be a fake bomb. Salem somehow later found out that they, they used a, a real device and threatened to drop out of the operation um, altogether. Austin Dunbar, the lead supervisor of the landmark, the FBI supervisor of the landmark plot, decides to have the, the same agent to slip back the next night and replace the bombing cap with the fake one. Mm -hmm. He mistakenly forgot. On um, June, four, um, June 24th, 1993, in the early morning hours, the plotters were mixing the chemicals with the bomb. And the FBI raided the warehouse. And the they did they were so infused with their work that they didn't even realize the FBI was just mere feet away with battery rams and MS sixteens and pointing at them. You know, it, when they woke up they, they didn't realize what was going on. They caught the plotters by, by such surprise that they, the agents were still looking at them, you know, uh, in the process of making the richest brew of chemicals that CLM likes to use. Um, so arrested during the sting for the landmark but were uh, Sadiq Sadiq Ali, uh, Rodney Hampton L. Uh, Fares, Kalafala Abdul Zaid, Mohammed Saleh, not to be accused with Mohammed Salome, who was arrested for the 93 bombing, um, Victor Alvarez, and Abdel Ghani Fadel. Um, Sadiq Sadiq Ali immediately returned state's evidence and gave up the blind shake of El Black Mark. He would go on to testify against the shake and the landmark body and also informed the government about Rockman's plans to use the plane at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, the lawyers representing the defendants wanted the tapes that Salim uh, collected used, and the lawyers were uh, William Tunchler and Ron Kuby, and they chose, the, the, they had to choose which defense they would represent because the blind shape actually chose to defend themselves in court. Um, Carson Dunbar, and a top New York FBI lawyer named Jim Roth uh, goes to Nancy Floyd and tells her to visit Imad Salem in his uh, safe house because he goes into witness protection uh, when the, the operation uh, compromised, when the operation finalized. And they tell him to retrieve the tapes. Meanwhile, they were not aware that Salem had sacredly taped the FBI superiors and even Nancy Floyd herself. And the FBI attorney, Jim, Jim Roth, Takes all the tape, all of them. Floyd is actually heard on tape admonishing the FBI supervisors in the FBI field office in New York about how they botched the 93 bomb itself. And she called them, um, quote unquote, chicken ships on tape and that they were cowards. And Salem's undercover work um, of not allowing the case to continue the 93 bombing. And she blames Carson Dunbar. So this caused a rift in the FBI field office. In return, Carson Dunbar, who's an arrogant person, uh, begins an internal investigation of Nancy Floyd. And she's uh, ultimately ostracized and chastised by her superiors. And even there was even a New York Post um, story regarding her intimate relationship with Matt Slim while undercover. But this turned out to be uh, fruitless. It, it was never, uh, it never uh, proved that she had some illicit sexual affair with Imad Salem. It was just to bring her name through the mud yeah. to, um, um, to meet and demonize her. Um, but the inquiry by the internal affairs later turned up nothing. It was too late. She, she's actually destroyed in her FBI um, uh, field. Uh, meanwhile, in the Lambark trial, Salem would testify against Rachman and the plotters themselves, and the tapes would be played for the courts as well. Um, but the defense lawyer, was examining Salem, argued that he was not credible because he lied in the, in the past about gaining his U.S. citizenship, about him being in Egyptian intelligence, and it was turned out to be true that he wasn't. Um, in February of 1995, though, Rockman actually pleads guilty to the landmark spot and also named other co-defendants involved. Um, so, in, in essence, he actually was um, an informant, but he wasn't. 
And on October 1st, 1995, Rachman and others were charged by a New York jury on um, 48 of the 50, 55 charges. And all the defendants, including Rachman, were given 25 years to life for the landmark trial. Okay, yeah, Emad Salem himself says he was careful not to entrap them in the way he would ask questions of them so that he couldn't then be unpicked in court. On this question of him being an Egyptian intelligence officer, he, he claimed in court that that was something he'd lied about. That's correct. He, he actually states to Nancy Floyd that he does work for Egyptian intelligence to bolster his, his authority front of him. And this was to also um, have him used as an asset inside um, the Brooklyn al Farouk Mosque itself. Um, because he was ashamed that he was just a, um, a limo driver, a chauffeur, if you will, mm. but top Egyptian authorities in uh, like Mubarak and um, others within the government because he felt embarrassed by that. Well, because in New York, um, he was meanly used in different jobs and he didn't feel important. So yeah, the being a high-ranking army officer in Egypt. Right, that's right. So to bolster his authority, he actually lied that he was um, some special intelligence service uh, within the Egyptian military and the Egyptian intelligence services. Meanwhile, that had to be brought up in court and it was shown that he was a liar. Does there remain any question around that? And I'm, I'm referring to Hosni Babarik, Egypt, the Egyptian president, came out afterwards and said, claimed that Egypt had a man inside the Brooklyn cell and they had told the Americans about the 1993 bombing and the Americans had ignored them over it. So do, do you think any ambiguity remains about Imad Salem and whether he was also an Egyptian agent or not? I wouldn't be surprised. I can't say for certain because I don't have any definitive evidence to show that he was Egyptian intelligence. However, um, it does remain to be seen that with Imad Salem, he gets the job of being of this uh, asset to the FBI uh, he does arrive in New York two years before he starts becoming this asset with the FBI when he's accosted in the hotel he was working at in New York by Nancy Floyd, who's working um, regarding uh, spy, Russian spies in New York. Um, but it just seems to me that this rather important task of infiltrating the Brooklyn cell, uh, you know, with him in mind. I mean, it just, it, there's a lot that went on also, too, with him and the blind sheik. Um, it was also rumored that Imad Salem himself uh, knew about the 93 bombing and actually came out that he wasn't told about the plot. The only person who knew where the bomb was going was Ramzi Yusuf. Mm -hmm. But there was conversations within the FBI where unnamed agents working in the New York field office that said that Imad Salem knew exactly where the bomb was going. And that the reason why he got out of the operation was not just because he didn't know how to build a bomb. It was also that he also knew too much and that he didn't want to relate this information to Nancy Floyd and his uh, 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 joint terrorism task force handlers at the set of Napoli was because that he wanted the plot to go along. And that um, in order for him to get out of this operation, he had to say that he was being followed by the FBI to the blind sheik, and the blind sheik actually believes him. But that the blind sheik knew that Ibn Salem was an Egyptian an asset, and that he allowed him to become a personal uh, bodyguard in short order. I mean, he becomes a bodyguard right away. And not just because he's Egyptian himself, it's that he himself was also Egyptian intelligence. Because you got to remember, Rahman was also an asset for who? Central intelligence agent. Well, th that's another aspect of this, really. I mean, not to detract from Imad Salem's achievement in infiltrating this cell, and if we take the story literally and the sort of heroism of that, okay. Um, but it, it's just it's interesting to gauge on how difficult is it for uh, an Arab person to infiltrate a cell like that, okay? Because at one point. Imad Salem's wife makes a mistake and answers the phone to two of his co-conspirators and tells them that he's out with his FBI friends at the time. So she basically 
accidentally dobs right. him into the terrorists, right? And he manages to talk his way out of that and convince them that the FBI were trying to recruit him, but they didn't get anywhere. And the guys kind of arrange to pat him down for a wire after that, but that's it, right? He continues as part of the cell. So um, you would think that they would have suspicions about someone coming from an ex-Egyptian army guy with bomb-making abilities. Um, so I, I wonder what, like, what kind of security protocols these groups have against being infiltrated. Yeah, I, I don't think there was much in the way of um, uh, the strict uh, background search regarding members of the Al-Farouk Mosque. But the irony of that is that the Al-Farouk Mosque and the al Kifa Refugee Center, which is right next to the mosque, um, is actually infiltrated by intelligence agencies of the CIA and the FBI. And um, regarding Rahman's personal background, where he has direct correspondence with uh, the Central Intelligence Agency. That's how he got in the country. They gave him the, uh, the U.S. visa that he applied for six times, and he was actually approved five times at the embassy, uh, which is run by an agent within the Central Intelligence Agency. Now, I don't think that the ground level people regarding uh, uh, the, the soldiers, if you will, of the Al-Farouk Mosque were anything more than these uh, loyal uh, Salafist members who don't have much in a way like um, a prominent educational background. Mm. But I think most of these people were just used as much like in a way of the Saudi hijackers that were the muscle hijackers, the Salafists that you know, have no uh, background educational training. These people are just used for muscle and that's it. Um, high end of these people, the high prominent members like um, uh, Sadiq, Sadiq Ali, or um, Rodney Hampton L, these people do have like close uh, intelligence background, like Rachman, um, on a different level and use these people uh, to, um, as pawns in their operations, which involve like a bombing campaign. And they're the ones who take the fall. I mean, look at uh, the 1993 bombing, um, who gets caught right away? Well, the, the foot soldiers, Abilima, Salame, and one escaped at Yassin, Abdul Rahman Yassin to Iraq. He's, he's the only one that never gets caught. Yeah. Well, it's a point Imad Salem makes in his book that um, initially Carson Dunbar just wanted to go after Sadiq Sadiq Ali and not pursue a wider conspiracy again. And there were too many other FBI agents interested in the time and working on the case for him to get away with that. But that's really a repetition of what you see of the arrest of Al Sayyid Nasser over the Maya Kahani assassination, this refusal to see it as a wider conspiracy. Okay, this is, and, and then Carson Numbaugh was the one who was active in essentially facilitating the bombing going ahead by pulling Imad Salem out of the cell. And yet again, there is this effort to protect, whether it's intentional or not, an effort to protect the wider cell in Brooklyn. Right, and I think that's the case. I think especially the Central Intelligence Agency was that they were funding the Al for Refugee Center, which is a direct connection to the uh, Maktab Al Kitabat in Pakistan, which was the, um, the training and operating center for Mujahideen fighters. They would train and fund them in fighting the war in Afghanistan against the Soviets. Well, the Al for Refugee Center, which is the largest uh, operating center to the Maktab Al Kitabat, and they have of course, offices in Arizona and Oklahoma and New Jersey, New York, and I think 36 other cities in the United States, where the, the, these centers are also funded, not just by the CIA, but also by intelligence services like the CID in Saudi Arabia, the Pakistan ISI, and they all have their agendas where they want, um, seemingly they want these uh, operatives close to home, so they can monitor them, but also at the same time where you know, they're conscripting these uh, operations, these terrorist operations, and seemingly they were to do it at will, where the FBI themselves were trying to investigate these issues. And they're hindered either by the CIA by not sharing the information or that the FBI uh, not monitoring close enough these, uh, like the Brooklyn cell and the Muhammad Atta cell, which is later, um, not monitoring enough, not having the information enough 
to do a proper investigation in the first place, and which also leads the door wide open to conspiracy theorists who think that the FBI is also involved, um, which I would say that that might be the case maybe with the 93 bombing, certainly not the case with the 93 attacks. But with the 93 bombing, I think we're just in early uh, to do a proper base give investigation. I think, where it goes back to your point, the terrorist cells are just enormous and they were just overwhelmed and didn't have the necessary resources. Well, I think you come to something of a dead end here, right? Because you can't speak to people's motivations for their actions beyond a certain point. So right. the FBI, in the person of Carson Dunbar is certainly involved in the 93 bombing in the decision to pull the informant out of the cell. Okay. Now his motivation for doing that, we can't really know. Um, what was it? Because as Imad Salem said, Dunbar was kind of racist and he didn't like this Arab coming in and telling him what to do. And the guy was an egotist and, um, he just did it because, you know, you kind of meet assholes in life who are, who are like that, you know, is, is that the case? Or do we not have the full picture on his reasoning? Or was he doing it because he was under instruction? Uh, he's some sort of CIA asset and his job was to protect the cell. And, and we right. can't really know that. I know um, I did order a book with this information, but it hasn't arrived on time for it, um, talking about Carson Dunbar in connection to the Iran Contra and the cover up of that. So maybe there is a deeper CIA history there. Right. And I think uh, also it needs to be very important too. We could speculate all day long about what the agenda yeah. was. And I, I tend to stay away from speculation because it never goes anywhere and you're always left with more questions than answers. And but I won't dismiss the notion that Carson Dunbar had nefarious um, agendas regarding pulling out Imad Salem to allow the operation to continue. It's seemingly plausible. But until that information arises where we definitively know, I, I tend to stay away from that. But I don't at the other hand, dismiss the notion that they, you know, he could have had um, his contact with the CIA, which was, uh, you know, known now uh, regarding a New York Times article. Um, but uh, I tend to stay away from speculation because I'd rather deal with what sure, you know. Sure, it's just, it's just a case of recognizing when you have reached that line. Right. You can't, you can only cross by speculating, okay? Because you can't know people's intentions or their psychological process, who they talk to in private and secretive ways and, and so right. on. So you, you're at, we're at that point pretty quickly sometimes. Okay. Sure, in, this, in this regard, we are. Sure. Yes. Is, is there anything else you wish to say about the, the landmark plot? No, I, I, mean, I, I mean, the landmark plot wasn't a very... Um, uh, a very external type of operation. It was very short-lived. Actually, it only took a couple of months. Um, but just, it just goes to show you that these uh, operatives within the al Farouk Mosque weren't some day-to-day, um, -day, uh, uh, almost like um, this redundant uh, group of people that didn't have, um, you know, a uh, a stick to stand or a stone to stand on in regards to like, oh, we'll just create this operation and if it goes well, um, you know, that's fine. Or like you have this, for example, they weren't like this ISIS bomber that went out to the New York City subway, uh, had a bomb strapped to him and he just blew himself up. And he didn't even kill himself. These people uh, under Abdul Rahman had an agenda and that was to attack large scale, large scale attack involving numerous Mm. Uh, high-profile offices and buildings in New York. It, this wasn't some day-by-day -day or night-by-night -night operation. This was a long thought, thought, uh, thought process and involved a lot of people that have a lot of connections abroad, too, because Rahman still had connections with uh, terrorist uh, operatives, al Gamma Islamiyah, Al-Jihad, Egyptian Islamic Jihad in Egypt. So he did have contacts, and especially in, in Pakistan as well. So. Um, it is also worthy to note that these operatives will also have influence in future operations that we'll talk about in the future regarding the Pajinka plot and 9-11. Yeah. Okay, well, we've tied up this strand of what happened in New York post the 93 bombing. Um, in our next interview, we're going to follow the other strand, which is Ramzi Youssef, his escape, what he got up to next in Pakistan and the Philippines, and really focusing on the important part of that, which is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the 
Bajinka plot. So I, I think in the next episode will be there or we'll be building towards it anyway. Uh, the Bajinka plot as the kind of the prototype for 9-11. That's correct. Yeah. And I, I, I think what people will get out of it is that uh, most people, especially in the truther community, um, mistake that 9-11 came from uh, Operation Northwoods, which is a, uh, a secret document that came from the State Department where it involved um, uh, a false, uh, given that Cuba attacked the United States. Um, no, the, the operations for 9-11 came strictly from the Bajinka plot, which I will outline in our next item. Yeah, well, I mean, the, you, the, whatever people ultimately think about that, you kind of need to know about both to make that decision right. or to even debate or enter that discussion. You know, does 9-11 emerge out of uh, an increasing level of CIA-type operations or U.S. military operations, or, of which Northwoods was one rung in the ladder of escalation, or does it emerge from an escalating Islamist threat coming from the outside or is right. it sort of interwoven aspect of the two of them so when we've laid the narrative down we can go into those questions um, but you need to know the narrative right to to be able to right, right absolutely and i i agree with this you know and a point i brought you off camera is with michael collins piper who's a dedicated researcher late michael sees and is he actually believes what i believe that 9-11 was actually originally an islamic operation which was then manipulated by the intelligence services of the Mossad in Israel and the CIA in the United States. And I'll describe that in a future interview when I mean. Yeah, okay, so there's a reason to stay tuned. Uh, we'll be describing that as we go. Thank you very much for today, Adam, and I'll look forward to speaking to you next time. Thank you for having me, Richard.